Welcome to Casual Friday. I want to start off with a couple of new topics that are textile related that I was introduced to this week that I think you might find interesting. I'm going to update you on my sweater design in progress and talk about some of the challenges I'm looking at and some, some things I'm considering about uh, changing or maybe just living with. And then I'm going to answer a question that someone had about traveling cables and wondering if a chart that I had supplied for a technique video a few weeks back might have been incorrect. There are direct links down in the video description so you can jump from place to place. So let's get started. My husband sent me a link to an article a couple of days ago and he said, I didn't read this, but it sounded like something you might be interested in. And it was an article on a website called Lit Hub, and I'll put a link to this article down below. And it was, the headline was something like, maybe we should call it the flax age instead of the iron age. And the article was about how archaeologists who historically have been predominantly male have sort of n named different ages of humanity, the Stone Age, the Iron Age, the Bronze Age, or maybe it's the Bronze Age, and then I think it's the Stone, the Bronze, and then the Iron Age, kind of based on the tools and weaponry <laughs> in particular. That, human, that humans had created in those time periods. And part of that is because metal objects last. But they, they didn't name things, you know, the pottery age or, you know, the textile age or anything like that. And so this article was talking about sort of the history of textiles and how fragile they are. And so when we find particular fragments or evidence of that, humans were spinning fiber and then weaving it or doing things with it, decorating it, um, that it's really a valuable find because these things are so delicate. One of the things that the article pointed out was that in the country of Georgia, there was a find where they found um, evident of these beautifully preserved textiles that were in perfect conditions that were, I think, more than 30,000 years old. So these are the oldest textiles and they were really elaborately made. It wasn't just something of like burlap or something. It was a very nice fabric. So you know that the technology and the thought into how to create something like that had to go back even further. So they were talking about the, these different historical finds and I, I was like, it was a really interesting article. Well then at the end they pointed out that this article was excerpted or based on a book called The Golden Thread. And I'm, I'll put a link down to the article below and the name of the author whose name I cannot remember. Um, I looked to see if our local textile center library had this book so I could go check it out and they don't. So I'm going to be um, purchasing it myself this weekend. Be, but it just sounds like a fascinating book. Um, and it's, and I, you know, I looked up, well, what were those different eras, the Stone Age, the uh, Bronze Age and the Iron Age? Like when did they occur? And so the Stone Age goes back millions of years, uh, all the way up to about 3000 BC. And then you start getting into the Bronze Age for a couple of thousand years, and then you get into the Iron Age. And, but we're talking with, with textiles going back more than 30,000 years in terms of spinning fiber and turning it into um, cloth and then making that cloth into clothing that humans would have worn. So it's a it's a different perspective of looking at innovations that humanity has had. And pottery goes back, you know, even further. So to me, that's a that's a an interesting and different way of looking at our progress in humans in terms of how we were living our daily lives, which is always more interesting to me than how we were living our warfare, our lives of warfare. But certainly um, some of the tools would have been for hunting or, or, or things like that, or for cutting or, or think butchering animals and, or things like that. But so much of what we 
we use in our daily life has to do with dressing ourselves and cooking food for ourselves and storing food and, and all of those things. And to me, that gives a far more interesting look at the our, the span of humanity. So if that's something that's of interest to you, again, I will put the link to the article as well as the book down in the description. The second topic that I was introduced to this week was on the topic of cashmere goats. Now I knew that cashmere fiber came from goats. I thought that that was a specific breed and that that breed just produced a coat that was, that was very fine because cashmere is defined based on the micron count of the fibers and how fine they are. But actually it turns out that there are a lot of different kind of goats that can produce cashmere and it's called cashmere when the coat that that goat is growing in the winter time meets those conditions of being called cashmere. And then there's pashmina, which again is not a real thing. It's just a way to define very fine cashmere, like the finest, uh, smallest micron count of cashmere then is, is called pashmina. But there are no goats, like there's no breed of goat that is really a cashmere uh, goat. There are lots of different goats that produce this, this coat. And so that's what I'm trying to figure out is if, is if goats that, are, that live in northern climates where they have a winter where that gets colder, if all of them then grow this winter coat, but some of it is just too coarse to be considered cashmere and so it's just allowed to fall off of them and nobody worries about it, but on the goats where the fiber is really fine and is sought after, those are cashmere goats. And then I suppose you breed them for those qualities and you, you, are, you end up with a herd of goats or a flock of goats, I'm not sure which, that have the qualities that you want. I don't know, I'm still learning about this. It's very mysterious to me and it's one of those topics where because I know so little about it, I don't really know how to search to get the answers that I want. So, but it is something that's interesting to me. The fiber of cashmere goats comes in a range of colors. There's white, cream, so white and cream are not the same. So it's white and cream, apricot, then a light gray and a dark gray. There's no black. And she's really interested in this apricot color, like the natural colors of these cashmere. And she is breeding her goats to try to get them that sort of Irish setter red and then they produce this beautiful apricot colored cashmere. And when she was talking about the number of goats that they had and then how little fiber they get from each goat, I thought, how are they making a living from this? Well, it turns out they have a whole lot more goats than it's just their cashmere goats. They have a bunch of goats that called the Munch Bunch that they rent out to different uh, communities or property owners or government uh, or parks or whatever. And they fence them off in a certain area and then they eat the invasive plant species like buckthorn, which is a problem here in our part of the country. So, so that, okay, that's, that's how they're, they're sustaining their farm and then they're really focused on these cashmere goats. It was a fascinating um, evening and they had an email list that you could sign up for. And then in like March or April, they're, they're gonna email us out and then we can have the opportunity to go to the farm when the, when the goats are, being, are ready to have their cashmere removed. And the way it's removed is they brush them for an hour or two at a time. And um, so then we can have, and then supposedly whatever we brush off of them, we get to keep. So I'm not sure how that's going to work out, but I am planning on going to that if I, in any possible way, can. So it's something to look forward to um, this winter. So a few years ago, I designed a sweater for myself that I really like, and anytime I wear it on the channel, people ask me about it. So I've been wanting to turn it into a sweater design if I possibly could. In the meantime, my daughter said that she would like a version of that sweater with some modifications from the way I knit it for myself. And because she doesn't live at home, 
and um, but she will be home for Thanksgiving and I wasn't completely sure about how long she wanted the body of the sweater because she's young and she wants it to be quite a bit shorter than what I would want for myself. I decided to knit it uh, top down and with set in sleeves. So I've, I've done this sort of construction a few times in the past and I find it to be the most challenging uh, start to a sweater. <laughs> and, and as I've been working through this one, I, I started it three or four times in refining how I, the, the cast on numbers I actually wanted to start with and, and how I wanted to do the shoulder shaping and when I wanted to start the cables and oh, I didn't like the way that version turned out. I'm going to rip it out and start again. I finally um, got things started the way that I wanted and I've been working down the front and uh, it's a v-neck so the cable is maintained all the way down and so the stockinette portion is the part that gets bigger and then as I'm working down the sweater I'm creating the set-in sleeves so there are a couple of things that I'm not loving about my results and I'm considering not ripping this out um, but starting over and then comparing some changes that I have in mind with this one and then seeing uh, which one I prefer. So I wanted to tell you a little bit, I will show you a little bit about the, this construction method and how it works and uh, where this construction approach originated and how it's evolved over the years from uh, one designer to another. And you know, I've done a few of the different takes on this particular construction process. And so with, with this sweater, I'm needing to come up with maybe my own approach for how I want to knit it. So we'll go to the overhead and I'll kind of uh, show you how this all works. So here is my daughter's sweater just laid flat. So as I mentioned, this has worked starting from the top down. So the way that this sweater is begun is that you cast on this kind of construction, you cast on for the back from uh, the edge of the shoulder to the edge of the shoulder and you mark where the neck stitches actually begin. And then you work some shoulder shaping. I did short row shoulder shaping for each of the shoulders. So you're working back and forth um, doing shoulder shaping so that, that the back um, up by the neck is higher than it is by the shoulder. So once you've completed that, then you work straight for a little bit. In my case, I worked for about an inch. So as I was working the short rows, this part was getting longer, but this part was not. So once I started working in long rows again, I worked about an inch. And then what you are supposed to do is you work all the way across. So I'd be purling across. I'd be on the back side of this. I'd be purling across all the way to here. And at this point, I would have had an edge along the shoulder right here. And then I would pick up stitches along this edge. Now, in order to do that, I have to pick up from the purl side. So I have to pick up as if to purl, which is kind of a pain. And then I work my way across the cast on edge, which is right underneath here. And I'd have to pick up as if to purl along this edge because this is the side that would be facing me. Then I would be working back and forth, uh, doing shoulder shaping right here. And at the same time, I was establishing this cable while I was creating the shoulder shaping. And I spent a long time trying to decide at what point am I going to start this cable. Let me zoom in on it. So I have a few rows of purl and then these are closed cables that I start right after that. So I began these closed cables while I was still working the short row shaping. So that was uh, something that I had to figure out at what point am I going to do that. If I finished the shoulder shaping and then began it, I felt like the cable started too far down the shoulder. So that was part of why I was ripping back and forth. So. After you finish the shoulder shaping, I'm establishing the cables. And again, I work about an inch in length. Then I come back across this edge and I pick up 
that inch worth of stitches along that edge. And then I work across these stitches, which were already there. Again, work all the way across over to here, pick up stitches along uh, this edge. Then I pick up along the top of the shoulder, work back and forth doing my shoulder shaping, establishing the cables. And then once uh, I'm done with the shoulder shaping, I work about an inch and then I'm, have the purl side facing me again and I have to purl all the way across, pick up a zip to purl here, purl all the way across. From that point on, I'm working back and forth. And as I'm working back and forth, every time I come to where the sleeve is, which is the sleeve was established where I'd picked up stitches there. Every time I come to this place, I increase uh, at each edge there on every right side row until and, and keep going on down. So there are a couple of things um, that I don't like about this. One is I chose to do a slip stitch along this edge to kind of define the the where the body ends and the sleeve begins. It's something I'd done in a previous sweater I knit that was somebody else's pattern. Um, and I chose to lean the increases for the sleeve toward that slipped stitch as the instructions from this other sweater had me do, but I used a different increase than that pattern had called for, and I don't like the results. I, the other sweater I did was a fingering weight, so everything was smaller. I just, I just don't like this slip stitch, and I have knit one other sweater using this kind of a construction that was by a different designer, and she leaned her her increases the way that I instinctively would want to, which is toward the area changing in size. And I don't believe she had this as a slip stitch. It doesn't appear to be um, slipped. Uh, from when I look at the sweater, I have to look at the pattern. And I just like the look better. So th the increase that I chose to use over here as well as here is just a yarn over, which I then worked twisted on the following row. And in many situations, I like the result. In this particular situation, I do not. I think it's just too obvious. I think there are a couple of things I don't like. I don't like where I placed it. I have one stitch, you know, one knit stitch here, and then I, I work the increase. I think I would like to have two knit stitches and the increase to the side, and I might choose to use a different increase. So I just, they're just, a number of things that I I am not happy with, but there's a couple of things I'm very happy with. I'm very happy with how I finally established um, this shoulder. I'm happy with the cast on method that I chose. I used uh, a different method than any place that I had seen anywhere else, and I really like the result. So this construction method, this top-down simultaneous sudden sleeve construction was invented by Barbara Walker. And it was published in her book, Knitting from the Top, which was published in, I think it was 1972, it was very early 70s. The same time she was publishing all her different stitch dictionaries, she was also inventing new construction methods for sweaters. The way her original version of this sweater was to cast on with a provisional cast on. So you'd have live stitches, you know, going this way and you'd have live stitches going that way. And her method was to provisionally cast on and then um, to work the shoulder shaping um, just for the back as I have done. Um, but then she would join another piece of yarn to do each of the fronts. So she would have three yarn tails. And once the front and the back had each been worked for a particular length, in her case, she was saying, whatever you want the circumference of this sleeve to be, um, she would want you to work it so that one third of it was right here. So you'd have one sixth um, on the back and one sixth on the front. Now this is the 70s. And this is kind of a, a wide sleeve cap, and we tend to use narrower sleeve caps these days, which is why I only had a couple of inches. Um, but that was her thing, was that you, you work the shoulder shaping for the back and you work it until it's this long, and then you join and you do the front um, separately, each front separately with separate yarn. And then 
once you have have the the width that you need for your the top of your shoulder cap then you work from with the right side facing and then you go across all the way here you're doing a knit row you're going to pick up as if to knit along here you're going to knit across here you're going to pick up to knit along here and then you're going to knit across here and then you're going to be going back and forth and you're going to be increasing your sleeves um, along here so that's her method the method that I was using has you cast on with a regular cast on, uh, work your shoulder shaping, pick up stitches, you know, and then you're picking up along this edge. Uh, what that does is give you some stability along this edge and it gives you stability at the back of the neck so that you pick up stitches for the neck later. And it prevents that, that neck, because the entire weight of the sweater is going to be sitting on this shoulder. It's going to prevent it from, from falling down your arms, which is particularly an issue if you're working a cardigan, and especially a V-neck cardigan like I am. There's nothing holding this thing together in the front. And if you have um, no structure across the back of the neck, it's going to slide down as well. So so I, what I think I'm going to do in the next go round is once again, do a regular cast on, then I will go back and forth like Barbara Walker um, does until I have this length that I want. Then I will join a new piece of yarn and I will do the left edge, the shoulder and this left edge. Join another piece of yarn and do the right, of, or this is the left front, the left front. Do the right front, then the left front. And, and then do as she does, which is work across, pick all the stitches up, work across, pick all the stitches up. So I will continue using the width of, of the top of the sleeve cap that I want. So I'm going to be using kind of a hybrid of her original version and the version that I've been doing, which I find really awkward and difficult. Uh, it's a bit kind of a pain in the rear to do. But I will, I do want a cast on edge here um, that will maintain some firmness for the back of the neck so that when I work the ribbing later, um, it will stay in place. The other thing I'm going to do is experiment with different increase methods. I'm going to eliminate that slip stitch here and just do increases and I'm going to lean my increases toward the area changing in size, not toward um, the front, which is what I was doing and which I think caused some of the aesthetic issues that I didn't care for. So those are the changes I'm gonna do. I'm not going to rip out what I've already done. I'm gonna start with a new ball of yarn. I've got plenty of yarn. And then I'm going to compare uh, the two methods and see uh, which, I, which I like better. So I wanna answer a question that someone had in the comments of a video, a technique video that uh, came out a few weeks ago. And there were, there were videos on two weeks so, and they were on closed cables and then Viking cables. So there, those two types of cables are related to each other. And I had examples of the same cable done using each of the techniques. And I provided charts for each of those types um, in a link in the video description so that people could try them out if they wanted. And there was a woman who commented and said, I love this cable. I'm going to use it in a sweater for my husband, but I'm wondering if on row 17 of the chart, if that cable was supposed to cross the other way. Uh, I decided to do that, do it that way and I like it better, but I'm just wondering if that's actually correct or not. So, um, so I'm gonna go back to the overhead and show you what she was talking about. And then I wanna talk a little bit about uh, how this particular cable taught me a ton about traveling cables, um, both how to design my own cables, but also just how to read my knitting when I'm knitting um, from an existing pattern of somebody else's and to be able to tell when I have two of the traveling ropes meeting each other, whether I'm supposed to cross to the left or to the right, like how do I tell which, which I'm supposed to do. All right, so here are just some typical stockinette-based cables. And what you can see is if you look at uh, this column of cable right here, you'll see that this, the left half of the cable is crossing over and becomes the right half. So it's crossing over the top, 
but then the next time the cable crosses this particular half of the of the stitches is now going under so that's how you get this kind of rope effect is that the two halves you're always crossing to the right so it's sort of like if you have you know two ropes like this that you're actually twisting over the top of each other that sometimes the black one is coming over the top of the white one or the lighter gray one and sometimes it's going underneath like that but it doesn't have to like right here you can see that in this case, you've always got a half, the same half of the stitches are crossing left and right, and they're staying on the top. And if you put two of those side by side and have them, um, one going to the right, one going to the left, and then having them both go toward the center and away, you get this little honeycomb type of, of thing. The other thing that we often like to do in cabled settings like this is you can see that thing that I've mirrored things so this was going right left right left and so is this one but I'm having them go in opposite directions at the same time so I'm going to the right over here and the left over here so where these cables are mirroring each other when you look at traveling traveling cables are a little bit different they consist of individual ropes of say two knit stitches and there'll be a number of them and they are moving across this background of purl stitches. But when two ropes meet each other, one crosses um, over the top of the other. So just like when we had this cable where uh, half the time the dark one was crossing on top and half of the time it was crossing under. So every time it crossed, it was crossing differently than it did before. That happens also when you have multiple ropes. So that the, if you look at this rope, you can see it's crossing on top of the first rope it meets, but then it's crossing under the next rope and then it's crossing over the top. So this allows the ropes to weave. And again, it doesn't have to be this way. You can have situations where you get a cable very much like this, but instead of this one that's coming off to the right going under and the one that's coming to the left coming over, that they might cross each other and both ride on top. It gives a different look, a different appearance um, than when they're always weaving over, under, over, under. Um, but in most cases, you're gonna have a situation like this. So the person who was commenting was commenting about this particular cable. And she was working it, she really liked it. And then she got up to the point right here and she saw that these were both crossing to the left and she thought that didn't look right. She thought maybe the, the chart was wrong and so she wanted to cross this one to the right instead. And I told her she could do that, but if she did, this rope crosses over, we've got two ropes crossing over each other in a rope cable situation and then the two ropes of the rope cable separate. This one that came under is now going over and this one that went over is now coming under. So if you wanted to mirror this and have this one on top, you could do that, but you'd have on top, on top, and then if you come around here, that's on top as well. So if we take a step back and look at this, these two are not mirroring each other. This one is actually, if you, if you look at this, it's as if it was flipped instead. Um, it's not mirrored. And it really can't be. <laughs> because if you follow these rules of over, under, over, under, there's no way um, to mirror these two cables because they are connected by this rope cable here. So since this one comes over, it's got to come under, it's got to come over, and then it's got to come under. So when these cables are crossing, both of these are crossing to the right, both of these are crossing to the left, both of these are crossing to the right. And it has to be that way in order to maintain the rule of over, under, over, under, and having this cable in the center that's connecting the two. Now it is, it would be possible to mirror. So here I have, I've incorporated a different version of that cable uh, in this sweater. And you see, I have that idea of mirroring all one on one side and one on the other. But again, they aren't really mirrored. And I remember when I knit this sweater 
and I posted the photo on Ravelry, somebody commented and asked me if maybe I had crossed one of the cables incorrectly and if, if they were being crossed incorrectly. And I said, no, because again, what we have here are these right crossing cables, these, these cables right here, and that is going to determine how these ropes separate and how they cross each other. And because this cable also has the right crossing cables here, it can't mirror that, it has to be flipped. Now, it would be possible to mirror these if I had these cables crossing to the left. And that would be a very common thing to do, to have one side of the sweater have the cables crossing this way and the other half having them cross that way. And so that was a design, design decision that I had to make, but then I had to decide, well, what am I going to do with this cable that goes into the center? I could have eliminated it. I could have made it seed stitch in the middle. I wanted something a little bit different in here. I could have left it reverse stockinette. I could have left it seed, I could have made it moss stitch, or I decided to put this cable in. And because the center cable is crossing to the right, I decided that would be the element that ties all of the cables together, that they all are these verts. Every cable has, has this particular four stitch uh, two stitches crossing two stitches to the right cable in every one of the elements to kind of tie it together. I could have chosen to do something different, especially in here, or I could have chosen to mirror these two halves and gone ahead and left that one to the right. So depending on what your personal aesthetics are, you might choose one decision and somebody else might choose something something different. The way that these cables are presented, they are, they're not miscrossed that might bother you, you might notice that they don't cross the same and something doesn't seem quite right to you. Um, but once you examine what's actually going on with the cables, then you can see why it makes sense. Once you understand that these cables, if the cables you're working with use that over, under, over, under rule every time, that can really help you as you are working a cable. When you see two ropes meeting each other and you're not sure am I supposed to cross to the left or to the right, you can look, follow those, those ropes down to where they uh, crossed different ropes previously and, and you can see Oh, well, this, this uh, rope crossed um, on the top previously. This one crossed underneath previously. When they meet each other, this one's going to go on top and this one is going to go underneath. So that can really help you read your knitting and be more instinctive about um, how you're knitting your cable patterns rather than having to check with the chart every single time and really think about what you're doing. You can get to the point where it actually is um, pretty easy to know what to do next. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group. Rocks, rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.